invade Caribbean. And let me begin by saying that today's call is part of a series of hot topic calls on coral reef conservation hosted by the Nature Conservancy as part of our Reef Resilience Program and made possible by the generous support from NOAA, the Coral Reef Conservation Program at NOAA, and the MacArthur Foundation. So at the end of this call, I'm going to share some upcoming opportunities. We've got trainings happening this fall, um, some webinars we've got planned, and some additional new resources. During today's webinar, we're going to be hearing from four panelists. And we already received many questions from you in, in advance of the call, and so we'll be asking those first. But during the question period, if you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand within WebEx. There's a little hand icon um, above the chat box on the left-hand side. You can, you can raise your hand that way, and that will alert us that you'd like to ask a question, and we'll unmute you. So everybody should be muted during the call because it will create a lot of otherwise background noise. So we have the ability to mute or unmute you, and we will do that if you'd like to speak. Um, you can also submit your question using the chat panel. If you prefer, so you can just send um, either me or Elizabeth Schreck, the host, um, a message in the chat panel with your question. Regardless of whether you're asking it through chat panel or verbally, please be sure to let us know who you are and the name of your institution with your question. So let's get started. Um, for today's call, you're going to be hearing from four individuals that are each addressing the lionfish invasion in different ways. They're all from different geographies, and they're all working at different scales. Um, there are so many possible topics to discuss with regard to this recent invasion, um, and so many different people we can hear from. And I'm excited to see some of those people that we'd like to hear more from on this call. Um, we're, what our plans are to actually host another call in the near future to get a little bit more focused. Um, today, our, our goal is really to begin the conversation. Um, so the panelist is going to have a few minutes to share their work and give some context about, you know, in terms of what they're doing, and begin the question and answer session. So first I'd like to introduce the panelists, and then we'll hear from them. We've got with us today Dr. Dane Buda. Mm -hmm. Getting some feedback. Somebody is off mute. Um, Dr. Dane Budo, is, who is the principal investigator in the Marine Invasive Species Lab at the University of the West Indies at the Discovery Bay Marine Lab in Jamaica. He's the project lead for the National Lionfish Project under Regional Invasive Species Project, mitigating um, the threat of the invasive alien species in the Insular Caribbean Project. So this is funded through the Global Environmental Facility and the United Nations Environment program and is funded until 2013. Um, he has worked on the invasive green mussel, ballast water management, and currently on the lionfish invasion. We have with us Frederick Arnett II, um, who works with the Bahamas Department of Marine Resources as a research assistant under the, the same grant or the same project for the Bahamas, so the mitigating the threats of invasive alien species in the insular Caribbean. Um, as a member of the Bahamas Lionfish Task Team, Frederick is playing a key role in helping to mitigate the threat of invasive alien species to local biodiversity and the economy in the Bahamas. We have with us today Ramon de Leon, and he has, is coming to us from the Bonaire National Marine Park in Bonaire, and Ramon has been manager there since 2004. He's responsible for the long-term strategy planning for the National Park Foundation that supports the parks in the region and for the daily operations of the Bonaire National Marine Park. In is responsible for research and monitoring programs and thanks to the recent <laughs> lionfish engine is now responsible for their lionfish control program on Bonaire. We're also going to be hearing from Jeffrey Harris in the United from the US Fish and Wildlife Service in fisheries program for the southeast region. Uh, Jeff is an aquatic invasive species coordinator within that body. He implements a program that provides technical assistance and coordination for 10 states, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. He's worked on various invasive species issues over the last 15 years and has recently been working with a group of researchers on invasive lionfish in the southeast U.S. And Jeff will be sharing more with us about this work momentarily. So welcome our panelists, and thank you again for spending time with us today and sharing a little bit more about your work and, and also being willing to ask questions from the audience because I'm sure lots of 
interesting questions that we're going to hear um, today. So first up, I'd like to hear from Jeff. If you could give us your introduction in terms of the work that you're doing. And then we'll hear from Dane, Frederick, and Ramon in that order so you guys know who's on deck. Thanks, Jeff, take it away. Thank you. Uh, I'm a subject matter expert on lionfish. Um, my programmatic goals are for dealing with lionfish are to enhance coordination and to assist where appropriate the development of management plans, uh, particularly looking at different geographic scopes, national or regional. Uh, the activities that I'm involved with is coordination and collaboration with various partners. Uh, really, three, three main Three main activities that I talk about today is uh, the United States National Aquatic News and Species Hotline. Um, I receive basically a notification, um, a voicemail message from a call center. Call center, we have operators there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They have information to me through my BlackBerry. I receive the information. I look for the nearest responder in that geographic area, and then I have a message to them. And related to lionfish, they would receive a message, come to my BlackBerry, and for example, I'd send the information to uh, Aikens uh, of Reef, who's on the call today, and would then follow up with that res with that particular question. Next, I'd like to report on is um, we also provide through the Fish and Wildlife Service just a small amount of resources to various projects, and this year. We're fortunate to have uh, three activities related to lionfish. One project is in the U.S. Virgin Islands, and a partnership between U.S. Virgin Islands and NOAA. Uh, contacts are Jed Brown and James Morris, and they're doing a survey on cigateria levels in lionfish. A project that we're able to provide funding to is to continue collecting non-native marine fish reports and the lionfish and add them to the United States Geological Survey Non-Indigenous Aquatic Species Database. And this project is a partnership between Lakin, James Morris, and uh, Pam Schofield. The project is a study to examine lionfish impacts on the Florida Keys commercial lobster fishery, uh, continue uh, outreach, uh, public outreach on lionfish, and to support control programs for lionfish in Florida. And work is conducted by Lagans of Reef. I'm going to report on is sort of a very large project that I'm doing with four numerous partners uh, to address a need for a U.S. national or regional control plan for invasive lionfish. The process is to involve many stakeholders and the uh, where we gathered most of our, our stakeholders together is through, through a regional panel, which is the Gulf and South Atlantic Regional Panel of the United States Aquatic News and Species Task Force. A uh, uh, that was brought in front of this group, subject matter experts, was the threat to the ecology, economy, and human health by fish. Whether this panel thought it was of such an important issue it should be raised up to the U.S. Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force. The paid based on the presentations by subject matter experts, this indeed was important. The recommendation was passed up to the task force that they convene an invasive lionfish control ad hoc committee. This decision was passed up in May of 2011. The task force at their meeting accepted this recommendation and pulled together the committee. Currently undergoing a review. Basically, the scope of the review is the, the ecological, e economic, and human health impacts of lionfish and whether there is indeed need for better coordination through a regional or national control plan. The, of the uh, Invasive Lionfish Control Ad Hoc Committee is Lincoln's of Reef, Chris of uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Peggy. Of the Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Payne Field, the U.S. Geological Survey, Chris Furwan, the National Park Service, Antoline, the National Park Service, 
Jay Ballard of the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission and my representative U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. At this, I'd like to uh, answer questions and turn over my time. Thank you. Um, I think what we'll do is hold, unless there are any burning questions, hold questions until we get through each of the panelists. But um, just want to point out that that Jeff did um, list a number of resources, both individuals and agencies. And what we will be doing is we've got a sum list. We've got those links that we're posting um, in the um, on the, in our space. You can see next to the chat list. But um, we will also be creating a list for people to go to to find different resources. There are there's a growing list of resources for lionfish, and at this point, um, some of them are really centers for all of the information and others are just bits and pieces. So we're trying to figure out what the best one is and so we'd like to hear what folks on the call think um, once we get uh, through the panelists. So um, some of the links are already there. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, let's go to Dane and hear from Dane um, about what's happening in Jamaica. Okay, good day, everyone. Um, in Jamaica, especially with respect to the University of the West Indies, we have taken a research-driven approach by focusing on many of the things that we don't know in the region, or we don't know about the life in Jamaica, and feeding that information into the management of the lifefish. Most activities are done through the National Lionfish Project, the ESIC Project, which is funded by the UNEP and the, and the JEF. Uh, this is a four-year project, and it's halfway through this project now. The total value is 431000 uh, which is, of course, a combination of in-cash and in-kind support organizations. Church, um, there are many things that we're working on. Most of them are in its infancy and just getting off uh, on the way. There's a population density surveys and using a combination of in surveys as well as catch per unit effort data from divers that are actually removing lionfish from various areas in Jamaica. Habitat preferences for lionfish using GIS to prioritize areas for similar habitats for search and removal around the entire island, including um, offshore key, the Pedro key. We can have preferences and good contents. What is the lionfish consuming and how much of it is um, it's actually consuming. And that helps us to uh, provide information to the fisheries department with respect to management initiatives or management strategies to save or to conserve the fish that's been targeted by the lionfish. We are in the process of developing a lionfish trap, and the first part of this is actually looking at data that we are collecting now from actual fishermen using Antillian Z traps. I know the fishermen have been catching lionfish in the fish traps, but of course they use a variety of deploy methods, they use a variety of bait type, uh, soak time changes. What we're doing now in the descriptive phase is to gather all this information to be able to develop an optimum um, deployment and design traps to catch lionfish. In, in, in conjunction with that study, we're actually looking at the effects on the pot fishery in Jamaica uh, with respect to displacement of other fish that um, have been reported so far by fishermen. Reporting that the lionfish is actually in the fish pots, and most of the time they're finding only land in the fish pots. Um, if it does prove to be true, it would be good to catch lionfish, however, not too good for the fishermen who are going after other fish. Looking at the heavy metal contamination, if any, of lionfish in Jamaica, and that is being done with the University of the West Indies um, Near Sciences Center. Along the U.S. Geological Survey, we're examining population genetics, and Jamaica is one of the regional pilot sites for this project. We did our data collection for the economic impact of lionfish in Jamaica, pulling data on 
the tourism impact, the food impact, biodiversity impact, and the impact on public health. Of course, from persons um, that have gotten, of course, you know, when they get stoned, they're out for a couple of days, we take into account loss of income. Um, the results will be presented, hopefully, at the upcoming GCFI meeting. Uh, has embarked on a massive drive to improve the fish sanctuaries around Jamaica. Our strategy is actually using artificial reefs to have the reef fish recruitment in these areas. And before, where lionfish has caused impact on artificial reef fishers, it's a tie in our study on looking at these artificial reefs on reef fish recruitment in these areas. Uh, we're going to advise the fisheries department to implement a program of removal of lionfish periodically from these artificial reefs to ensure that they get some success in their fish recruitment. We do public education and outreach, and we have designed a two-day training program. Uh, it's similar to the training programs that have been happening, especially through the reef organization region. Um, we do make some adjustments to adapt it to Jamaica, but um, we look at the characteristics of lesions, the characteristics of lionfish, um, take participants um, in terms of safe removal from the water, safe of the lionfish to prevent being stung, and of course, how to prepare the lionfish to, for, for cooking. We promote the use of lionfish for food in a sustainable manner, remove of both the small lionfish large lionfish, which significant departure from what we have been, you know, both in Jamaica for decades now, about leaving the small ones and taking the large ones. But our message, we're trying to make our message very, very clean and clear. So we need to get these numbers down. So we're removing juvenile lionfish as well as the adults. A management standpoint, I mean, we're, we're helping out with some common not only and um, in the best practices manual for lionfish control and research that we launched at GCFI in November, we have five co-authors um, along with Noah Reef um, in Mexico as well um, on this manual as well as um, Simon Fraser University. Uh, university chairs the Marine IAS Working Group that not deals with um, lionfish in the region, but also as water management. Um, other invasive pathways for marine lesions within the region. We're always of the ad hoc regional lionfish committee. So you know, it, it's a good way of getting information about uh, getting information from these areas as well. And it really emphasizing the need for a regional approach to a process such as lionfish. And of course, learn some lessons for the upcoming invasion. Uh, we'll place the lionfish. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dane. That was great. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and hold your questions for Dane. Please make sure to send them to us if you um, would like. And we will move on and hear from Frederick Arnett from the Bahamas about what's going on there. Frederick? Okay, greetings uh, to everyone on the call. Bomb has chosen to address the lionfish invasion by employing various control and management strategies. The MT Isaac project, which is the mitigating threats of invasive alien species in the insular Caribbean. The MT Isaac project is a, is a regional project which was implemented by UNEP, which is the United Nations Environment Program, through GAVI International in 2009, and is by GF, which is the Global Environment Facility. There are about five countries, including the Bahamas, who are signatories to the four-year project. These can include Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, St. Lucia, and the Dominican Republic. Uh, the Bahamas signed on to the MT Isaac project in the fall of 2009. The Department of Marine Resources, which is the agency that I'm contracted with, is the national executing agency for the project in the Bahamas. The department is working in collaboration with several partner organizations to implement the project locally. Um, these organizations include the Bell Commission, which is the Bahamas Environment, Science, and Technology Commission, and it's under the Bahamas government. The 
Bahamas National Trust, the Nature Conservancy, the Bahamas Reef Environment and Educational Foundation, and the Luther Institute. As a part of combative efforts, we established a lionfish task team in September of 2010 on the experiment component of the project. Our fish task team is composed of representatives from each of our partner organizations. Um, has undergone a series of workshops led by Lad Aikens, Director of Special Operations at Reef Environmental Education Foundation in Key Largo, Florida. The training sessions were designed to equip each task team members with fish ID and line fish capture and handling skills. I that with these marine-based skills, task team members will be equipped to facilitate removal and training at our demonstration sites. The team has an upcoming training uh, in this September, and we believe once participants have successfully completed the workshop, they will be certified by Reef as fishing ex experts in the tropical western Atlantic region, which is the Caribbean base as well as the Atlantic basin. We have some of them will be able to train and equip other individuals in the future. As you can see, one of the main objectives of this project is to increase national capacity to invasive alien species, expand our partner or organizations and key stakeholders. In addition, we are also lobbying to reform policy. Um, we're engaging in educational outreach and we're encouraging the sale and purchase of lionfish domestically and where possible uh, internationally. So this is some of the work that we have been doing and uh, we hope to continue to do for the duration of the project. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Um, okay, let's go ahead and go to Ramon in Bonaire. Ramon, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Well, Ramon. Thank you. I would like to start telling a little to be the, the story of uh, the invasion of the different management strategy that we have been adopting since Ramon? the beginning can, of this Ramon? Year. Can you hear me? Yes. Can, Ramon, can you slow down a little bit and speak a little bit? I'm having a hard time hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. okay. Uh, since October 2009, there were lion fish were fierce of service on air. Uh, within months, the fish uh, spread around the island. Mm -hmm. So with active uh, elimination effort, uh, as they were planning it in a previously, previously action plan. The main uh, plan, the main goal of our effort, was the important areas of reef and flying fish as a repeat for native fish to, to enhance uh, the fisheries and and tourism as well. In April 2006, in April 2009, this was the uh, small before the first lionfish uh, appeared on air. And a series of workshops to inform the general public in general and the diamond industry in particular about the potential danger of the invasion. Uh, it was also the intention back then to communicate our plan that it was in a draft format of the game. We are preparing the different actors for possible action in the future. And then we invite the lab acting from Reef Environmental Education and Stephen Green from the University University in Canada to lead the, the workshop. And they based in their experience and advice to met their adaptation to our action plan. So still in the future of the live fish in October 2009, the learning curve in this topic, in this topic has been very intense. And fair adaptation to our initial plan can be upward. Can you, can you speak a bit louder? We're getting some comments there. Sure. We're having trouble hearing you and just a little bit slower. Is that any, can you hear now? When you speak slowly, it's a lot easier. There's a bit of a, a the internet connection is just creating a bit of a, a, a distinction. 
So hey, explore. Hey, oh, yeah. I will just love that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the, the adaptation that we did to our management plan, we from netting, doing netting to different things to report their netting inside the you know, live page and our recently shooting what we can now uh, with the combination of all the, the previous studies. Uh, we also have a training program for volunteers, which are more time resident volunteers and a uh, dedicated staff for the program. In later 2010, we will change uh, four years old to the to allow the, the marine park staff or people uh, afford by the marine park to carry special or modification of the how I mean, things. So. At the moment, we have uh, more than 200 volunteers contract shooting live fish. And the special research that we can do here and in the South in the uh, effect of education of invading live fish on land, the an active diving community is possible. In here, we tested the, the effects of our eradication effort, the abundance of lionfish between the between fish and non fish that here on one area. You can see there in the graph, the graph for five areas on one area from the left to the to the right, north to south. And you see the areas where people have very little access to fishing and in red. Where efforts are, are bigger, and you can see a huge difference. The same, same area, same kind of reef for the fish population. So, this, this is basically due to, to fishing. Uh, that program that uh, we started our process on the very early versus. At the start of the, the, in the game. And so I'm going to you next next slide. This is the this is the slide I was very. Yes, it is the uh, versus and fishes are here in Bonaire, and you see the difference uh, in the left part in the left of the graph, which are in the north of the island. It's huge difference. And the previous this one that you are seeing now is all the bars that you see in grid are side here corner and all the bars that you see in side black they're in full. So it's a few different and it could the same story of the invasion. Okay, so the first line is just one day after after we we saw it. The friends are are we just all that we have to buy mass in different environments that can some hands prefer versus where all the numbers for using this and also to to see the data that the live fish here on Bonaire are other efficient Centimeters smaller and almost uh, 50 grams lighter than in Curacao. Uh, we did last uh, really is very recent uh, study, but we that this fact is consistent with the uh, of the population that has been substituted with elected fishing methods like fishing uh, like by, by size. We are trying to target all the small and big, but it is much easier to. So the both depend on the habitat size, the number of the entire frequency zone. Our continuity can be effective as a lot it's pretty much what we're doing or here. 
Oh, Ramon, I think there was a tremendous amount of interference, and in, it was really, really difficult for people to hear everything that you said. Um, do you mind if I try to summarize at least the point I'm pretty sure that you made? <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay, so um, correct if I'm wrong on anything. Um, but one of the things that's interesting about Bonaire is that they had a management plan on how to address lionfish invasion before they arrived to Bonaire. So before lionfish showed up, they had already about six months in advance, they'd already had their plan because I think they knew what was happening in the rest of the Caribbean. And the main goal of their control program is to keep important areas free of lionfish. So Ramon's actually coordinating the removal effort, and they have developed an education and awareness program. Um, they work very in, um, closely with the dive industry already. They are already engaged with them because of their the way they manage their marine park. So this is a really natural, easy way for them to engage with the dive industry to help solve this problem. Um, Ramon's team is also working with folks in Curacao. So they are looking at com sort of comparing between the two islands and what's happening in the invasion. Curacao's control program started after Bonaire's. So um, they are, are behind in terms of um, how much, how effective they've been in their control program. They, this is actually seen when you look at um, the, they did an assessment in July to test the effectiveness of their control program. And you can see that um, in Bonaire, they were catching about two grams of lionfish per square meter um, compared to in Curacao, where they're catching about eight grams per square meter. So there's definitely more lionfish right now to contend with, it sounds like, in Curacao, at least in the areas where they were checking um, on the effectiveness of their control program. In addition to that, um, we, Ramon, said some things about how it really varies to, on, on which habitat type you're in and how many lionfish you find. Um, they've developed training programs. They've trained folks from other islands on how to um, catch lionfish. And then one of the things, an interesting piece about Bonaire is that they don't allow spear guns on the island. They're an illegal form of gear. So they have um, purchased special spear guns just for the use of shooting lionfish and um, they've purchased about I think 300 and the, the theme park is in charge of those and they are permitting people to go out and fish just for lionfish and so they're in complete control of those tools, the spear guns and they can call back at any time if they feel like they're being misused or um, so are, they have a very targeted Spear fishing program to control lionfish in Bonaire. Um, I think that's probably all I have that I captured in my notes, but um, that's enough to give you an idea if you want to ask questions of Ramon. And Ramon, for any questions, let's see if we can just keep you close to the mic and slow, and hopefully the internet connection will hold up. So, okay, so I want to thank everybody for providing some background on their programs. and. Just say that obviously, you know, there are a lot of people in the region that are doing this work and leading this work, and we will hear from more folks. We're hoping to hear from more folks in later panels, um, but this is our beginning, and we wanted um, to just go through the questions that we've received. We've received a number of questions from the audience already. Some folks couldn't make the call and wanted questions asked, and some are on the call right now. So you can always clarify if we if we um, interpret your question. I want to remind everyone. And to feel free to ask questions in the chat panel. Um, we'll continue to monitor that. And um, if if you feel like there's a discussion going on and you want and your question can wait, let us know and we'll make sure to do our best to answer during the time of the call. The call is going to end um, promptly after at 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, so 24 minutes. So I want to start off with a question. For Dane, um, and actually for Dane, Ramon, or Frederick can answer this question. Um, and, and the question is: Should we be focusing on so much removal, on the removal effort, putting our resources towards that, or should we accept that they are here and focus on preventing the next invasion? 
Dane? Okay. Yeah, actually, we a bit first. Um, we saw the, the invasion happening, and uh, we essentially started going out and removing live fish. I could figure out exactly what um, <clears throat> what to do about the management on a whole. Uh, there are some areas that we hit very, very hard and very frequently, especially the areas closest to our main lab in this Discovery Bay. Over time, we've seen that it has caused some impact in terms of reducing the numbers. I do think that it actually makes a little difference. That difference is I would still want to go about and get that little difference out of the way, especially when we have a very overfished reef system. Um, so far, from the gut content data, uh, we are seeing where warland fish has consumed individuals over a given day. So we'll actually find one individual with 20 or 30 individuals of free fish on the, uh, in, the, in those stomachs. So, I mean, if, if we actually start removing land fish or continue to remove land fish, the small dent it may seem from a land fish point of view, I think if it is, I'm not realizing it, if it is actually making a difference on the reef fish community, I continue. Um, the lessons that we're learning from the land fish uh, in Bijan will that help us to be more prepared for invasion that comes around from another species. Um, who what will that be? That's great. Um, anyone else want to answer that question on the panel? Ramadric? Can you hear me? Speak close to the mic. Put your face down to your computer <laughs> and speak, speak slowly. Oh, it's, 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 it's a bad connection. Yeah. Uh, the previous answer, I think we should be focusing both because where you have the capacity to make the difference. Uh, and, and if you remove it, you have the, the means to, to do it and the, the capacity to do it. And in time, we need to keep learning of this invasion. We need to keep uh, to more, more research to see what the real impact will be in different areas, different local species structure. And, and we have focus in both, I believe. Uh, well, efforts. To be, to be maintained because uh, here on Earth, we are completely, uh, I would mean, say, we have a lot of fish, but very low number. So why why not to keep the. Uh, okay, Dr. Ramon, so in this of what I got from you was that, that you know, continuing the removal effort is important. And it's you know, especially if you can maintain the population, you can control the population from getting out of control. Um, Ramon, my suggestion, because it is so difficult to hear you, is to see if you can reconnect back to us and see if perhaps that doesn't improve your connection. Um, can try that. Yeah, let's try that. Um, thank you, and I appreciate you keeping going to try. Um, so, Frederick, do you have any response to that? I I do. Okay. Um, I think it actually depends on each country's needs and capabilities. However, uh, the, the bonds has actually accepted land fish here at the state. This is primarily due to our geographic nature. Um, for those of you who, who've done an archipelago, so we're a chain of islands, some 100 islands and a thousand keys. So, um, on this method, this this makes eradication uh, basically not feasible and, and impractical, impractical. We don't think it's an option for the Bahamas, especially given given the abundance and their ability to occupy habitats that are beyond scuba diving limits. Um, some reports have stated that um, lionfish have been observed as deep as about 400 feet. So in light of our unique situation, We've extended our focus beyond mobiles to include preventing future invasions, control and monitoring in specific areas, such as MPAs, which 
Oxford and Marine Reserves and National Parks and the shore areas, so beaches, marinas, mining systems. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm going and, and structured the focus on monitoring and the inclusive of both lionfish densities and native marine fish communities. So our goal is is to attempt to keep our national protected area systems free of invaders as best as possible um, in the resources we have. Thanks. Eric, um, I have another question for you from the audience. Um, how are you communicating? This question is for, I believe, think probably most appropriate for Dane, Jeff, or Frederick at this point. So we'll let Roma stay silent this time around. Um, how are you communicating about lion fish invasion in, in your community and with key stakeholders? Um, just since we haven't heard from you yet, would you like to that question or pass? I'll answer it. Sure. Um, I, my answer is going to be similar to some of the other panelists. Um, there are many uh, networks already in place. I had mentioned earlier about the Gulf and South Atlantic Regional Panel that made up of southeastern states. So that's one way that, that we can communicate. Um, I also find that since I'm new to this subject, that's through myself with subject matter experts, where I can provide maybe a little bit of resources to keep a particular activity going, a database going, or a research, that seems to be helpful in that it keeps the information moving. That's all. Would anybody else like to share, Dane or Fred? about how you're communicating with your kiddies and stakeholders on the invasion? Um, sure. I, I, I can add to some. Um, we just could inform our local communities here in Jamaica. Uh, we've been doing a variety of things. Um, newspaper articles, uh, articles um, in our <coughs> e-servers, um, television shows, um, television features on our, in our primetime news features. Uh, going into the community as well by doing outreach activities. I mean, sitting on a sitting, even extent of sitting on a beach, fishermen even informally helps get the the message out. Uh, we've tried to take our messages and the mode of transmission of those messages to suit the particular audience. I mean, in some senses, some of these persons can't read. They don't have access to the internet. They don't have access to television. So we have to, you know, be able to reach them as effectively in the variety of media. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, do you want to share what's happening in the Bahamas? In terms of the Bahamas, um, as I mentioned before, we've have, we've engaged uh, our local partners through the reef level. One in one through five training, um, which has increased capacity and awareness. Um, and this this training has covered capture, handling, and cleaning of lionfish, as well as monitoring reef communities. In addition, we've also hosted the third regional consultation, which is a workshop for the MT Isaac partners here in the Bahamas. The development of the regional IS strategy, which is a component of the MT Isaac project. We invited TV stations and newspapers um, to cover the three-day workshop so that the general public within us would be aware of what's going on. Actually working on revising our National Invasive Species Strategy. Um, we're supposed to hold a meeting in September, engaging key stakeholders once again to participate. Um, through interviews and consultations, and just to provide the recommendations to updating um, the, the next, which was a 2003 document. So then this covers um, a wide variety of invasive species from terrestrial to marine to aquatic. And fish, um, we started documenting it in 2004. It was not initially included in the NIST. So we're hoping to include that and some others within the NIST. In it, um, we, the Department of Marine Resources, engage in public presentations, whether it's a combination of lectures or demonstrations, the local community. Um, and the demonstrations can be culinary, 
so there would be lion for haste testing and then we'll teach persons or show persons how to safely handle the animals and to clean them. And we've been involved in a uh, number of shows, for instance, uh, the Bahamas Agri Expo, which is run by the Bahamas government, uh, Thomas Food Services Food Show. Uh, we went to um, docks to reach local fishermen. We've gone to schools and workshops, and we've been on, on radio stations and TV shows. Um, in addition, we're looking at, um, we have developed uh, real television PSAs, and we're utilizing lionfish surveys as well. Um, it's a survey that we actually developed last year that we used to uh, identify the part about lionfish so that we can tackle um, that issue a little bit better so that we can communicate clearly so we can see the needs of, of the population in terms of what they are and are not aware of. Um, and also heavily involved in the development and distribution of educational paraphernalia, where the flyers, the brochures, the posters, we redeveloped a uh, lionfish not wanted as pets poster that we had um, read in various pet stores around the island. And we also have our partner organizations who are being instrumental in disseminating information, um, whether it's in park offices or through programs that they're involved in. Um, all we've, um, the Department of Marine Resources has supported lionfish tournaments and derbies. We've had 14 in the Bahamas thus far. So we're using a number of strategies and we're using a number of ways to try and um, this stakeholders, whether it's the public or whether it's private uh, or public organizations that can assist us in uh, trying to resolve the, the lionfish invasion issue. Thank you. Thanks, Nino. Uh, the Bahamas has been dealing with this problem longer than most in the region, and there's probably a lot more to learn. And um, perhaps if folks have questions about how certain things are working or how, how successful they are, um, we connect you um, to them so that they can benefit from what you guys have been learning as you experiment with different ways to address the problem. Um, so we have a ton of questions coming in through the chat box, um, and so we're going to do our best to, to answer some of them. And the ones we don't get to will help us sort of form the next webinar so that we can have more discussion and new experts as well for to expose the audience to. Um, I have another question. Um, this is there's sort of two related questions. Um, one is, what are the best resources for managers trying to deal with the invasion? So um, networks, listservs, documents, and trainings. And um, I've seen a lot of activity on the GCFI uh, listserv and talking about um, the lionfish invasion. And there's the ad hoc committee that created the International Coral Reef um, Oh gosh, I know I'm gonna. I knew I was gonna blank on that. The International Coral Reef Initiative, sorry, um, has put together an ad hoc committee for the region to address the lionfish. So there are certain, and I believe we've got links available on one of the slides we have to those resources. Um, and I'm just wondering if there are other resources that you folks on the panel or even people in the audience, um, if you want to raise your hand to suggest so we can hear what your experiences are for managers that are trying to deal with the invasion. Dave, do you have suggestions or perhaps somebody from the audience for additional suggestions of good resources? I was going to volunteer one of the attendees, which is Lad Aikens, if you wanted to chime in. Unmute Lad if he's interested. I can't tell. We'd, I don't want to unmute him unless he's sitting there quietly. Um, he's unmuted, actually. Lad, are you there? Hey, I was just uh, just listening in. Great, great. We'd love to hear from you um, in, in what's going on with Reef and resources for managers. What, what? Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Clearly, great. clearly. Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of work going on throughout the region involving 
um, different countries and agencies and organizations right now. And I think uh, I think they alluded to the best practices document that's being developed and will be held at the GCFI session in uh, Mexico in November. And that's really going to be a good resource. It's a compilation of a lot of the work that's gone on around the region and a lot of the a lot of the expertise. So um, the GFI also has held live fish sessions for the last uh, years, and we'll hold another session this year. That's a special session of the GCFI um, work. So there there are a lot of venues, and there will be a lot of publications coming. There are also a lot of websites that are available. Uh, specific country websites as organization websites. So much of that is available for somebody that wants to just do a quick internet search. Um, Lad, a question for you because we've been trying to figure out the best places, sort of like a one-stop shop. Do you foresee the possibility that GCFI is going to organize and, and try to be a, a, the all-be-all so that resources in terms of country lists where people are, you can see projects in addition to the networks available and the, the resource guides. Do you think it's going to be an all-in-one place, or are people going to have to keep looking for it in you know a variety of places, which is hard because they don't know if they've found the right spot? Right. So I think it's going to be a combination. I think there probably will end up being some very comprehensive um, resource locations, uh, web-based locations, and those now are being discussed in different venues. It's going to have uh, additional resources that are available out there through research websites, researchers that are working on this question usually have some comprehensive information on their their lab or personal websites from their institutions. Organizations are going to have information. And it's such a broad subject covering so many uh, different components from education outreach to research to control, I don't think you're going to have one location that you can do everything. I think it's okay. going to require some work to, to land, and it depends okay. on what you're looking for as to where you'd look for that. Sure. I guess fantasy would be to see um, a website address just totally focused on that where they had you know, links to everything. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll think about that and the opportunities for so people could do something like that. That is being discussed. And, is it? And okay. That's some exciting. broader initiatives, but I don't think anything has been decided upon yet. Okay. That's great to hear. Um, but that's always a challenge for reef managers is not having time to look around. And if there's a place to go, you know, just go there, get, get everything you need. Um, thanks. I appreciate you um, sharing that. Um, sure. move on to another question that is is I think of interest to a lot of folks um, and see if again there are either folks on in the audience or on the panel that can help us answer this question um, and that is what efforts are being made to coordinate responses data collection at the local national and regional level I know we've heard a little bit about this project that both the Bahamas and Jamaica are involved in or other efforts that are going on that people can either um, can to or get get information from either be a part of it or you get information from to help them with their local work. Is there of coordination efforts? It's a large and complex region beyond what we've already discussed. The ad hoc committees and GCFI's work. Just so we're not missing something important. Hearing anything? So I assume that means the ones that have been discussed are ones to continue to watch and to connect into. Um, okay, I've got a couple of more questions that I'll probably be able to get to because we just have a few more minutes. Um, so I've got a question about marketing. Um, Frederick talked about the marketing that has gone on in the Bahamas and the Bahamas has conducted this large-scale marketing of fish and as, as edible as food. Um, with the Department of Marine Resources, and it's been very successful. And now they're trying to conduct studies on demographics. So the question is, are active marketing campaigns going on in other countries? This somebody who wants to know um, from the Bahamas, Lino Davis, um, because they're trying to link in and figure out how 
how people are doing it, basically. This is something actually we're going to probably discuss more in another call, but um, just wanted to hear from anybody on the call if they want to share um, the fact that they are actively marketing lionfish for food. They raise their hand. I know this is an awkward way to do it, but we really do want to hear from people if there's an active market. Okay? Um, I, can, I can probably weigh, weigh in a little a bit. Hi, um, Dan. Thanks. Yes. No. We used to do um, some work with Forest Seafood Company here in Jamaica. I'm very interested in marketing land fish. I mean, commercially marketing land fish, but not sustain the market for land fish. They want to protect the fish they already have on the market uh, from the land fish by removing land fish. Uh, of course, it's an unsustainable way that we want to market the land fish, of course. I mean, we want to take out the small ones and the big ones out of the water to fully create some kind of dent in the population. Uh, we have clear inter or messages um, that we transmit about commercial use of fish. We're very to the extent of um, making persons realize that we're not trying to sustain this. You're not going to make, we don't want to make money in country to make an increasing amount of money in perpetuity because that we actually want to reduce. Uh, we're doing it in a way to protect um, us getting other problems in the future. If, if, if this method does work to reduce the numbers of lionfish, we want to be you know, clear that you start making less money than you intended to make, you know about this from, from, from day one. So we're very clear about that. So that this partnership with the Seafood come actually um, have some that we can take from it as well. Thank you. For responses to that. I have one more question and then we're going to close the call. If there's any questions, so I apologize to those of you that have them and haven't had them answered. We are going to save all of your questions and work to address them in future calls. Um, okay, so I have one more question. Um, let's see, it, whoops, it just went off my screen. Hold on. There's popping up that it's hard to track. Question, I'm trying to remember it, has to do with, um, is there an organization, and I believe there is, but I, yes, that can guide or teach folks, this is coming from someone in the Yucatan, um, to teach us to catch and prepare the lionfish for human consumption. I believe there are trainings like this happening. Is there anybody on the call that's involved, perhaps led? I've, I know that you guys are doing trainings. Can you explain um, what those are about and, and how people that don't know where again might get started on that sort of thing, get involved in a training? That happens in Bonaire as well. Can I answer to that? Uh, yes, please. Go ahead, Mom. I from Mexico last week, which I learned from, from some initiatives that are going on there. But there are different in there. Here are my, uh, uh, particularly in Cozumel, where Ricardo, the manager of the Cozumel Marine Park, is what they do. And there are very important things in the all within the, the area of the park to marketing and uh, very very interesting. So if you have somebody in the outcomes interested in you know what's going on the vision here America is definitely a good person to contact. Simone, what I'm getting the feedback again and what I am what I'm hearing you say um is that you were in Mexico last week and you heard about what was happening in Cozumel and they were doing very important things in terms of control and marketing and that that would be a, a great person to contact there. Can you do me a favor and send me that contact and we will relay it to the person that was asking the question. Okay. Thanks, Ramon. Okay, so I, I want to apologize I, it, that we are not able to get to everybody's questions, we probably have a 20 questions that we haven't gotten to. So um, what I, I would like to let everybody know is that we will be in another webinar in the next 
um, and a half or so focused on the topic will probably, because there are so many different questions, have a series as long as people want to keep discussing this issue and, and trying to get information and, and turn it into potentially a different format where there are some presentations of individuals' work and opportunities to ask about that work. So there's just so much interest and we're happy to be a format for folks to use to communicate with each other. Um, so uh, we will be sending out a notification for another webinar. We will be reaching out to folks and asking them to participate. Uh, if you're interested in sharing your work on um, mortgage control or marketing, taking it to market, whatever. Um, there's so many aspects of this work. Let us know. Let us know what you're doing, and we'll try to put there some groups that um, make sense and, and have really focused calls. Um, just a close. I want to remind everybody that this call was recorded, so you can. The link will be available later on today or tomorrow. We'll send send the link out. And um, you can share it with others if you think that there was something that was said on the call that might be of use um, to a colleague. The, the, all of our calls are recorded under the Events tab on the ReefResilience.org website. So you can always go back there and look at our, the archive of our calls. We're going to be doing other um, webinars later this fall. We're going to talk about how core managers can use social media in their work, so that's something that will be coming up soon. And um, we'll also be announcing another training of trainers workshop that we'll be doing. So stay tuned. If you're not um, on our uh, newsletter list, please email us at resilience at tnc.org, and we'll put you on the, on the list. I want to thank the callers for sticking with us through some technical difficulties today, and especially the panelists for sharing your work with us today. We really appreciate hearing about it, and we're glad to know that there's so many different things happening um, addressing this very, very serious problem to coral reef um, ecosystems in the Caribbean. So thanks, everybody, and have an excellent day. The end.